Our guest this hour, Roberta Grimes, is a business attorney with a degree in early Christian history. Following two experiences of light in childhood, she spent decades studying nearly 200 years of abundant and consistent afterlife evidence, and at length she developed a detailed picture of what happens at and after death. Roberta's The Fun of Dying was first published in 2010, and The Fun of Staying in Touch came out in 2014. When she realized that 2,000 years ago, Jesus had told us things about God, reality, death, the afterlife, and the meaning and purpose of human life that are amazingly validated by modern afterlife evidence, in 2015, Roberta published Liberating Jesus. Now she continues her fun series and builds upon the truths of that book in her beautifully simple, The Fun of Growing Forever. Thank you for rejoining us again, Roberta. Oh, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for having me. So obviously not everybody has heard the other interviews we've shared with you, and I thought it would be great if you could share with us a little bit about these two experiences of light in childhood that has really launched your life path. Yes. Well, um, when I was eight, uh, I was a good little Christian child, and I woke up in the middle of the night one night. It, actually, it was April 9th, um, 19, 1955, I think. I, I even remember the date. It was quite alarming. I woke up and knew there was no God, and I was terrified. In the middle of that night, in the middle of my fear, there came a flash of light in the room, and a young male voice said, you wouldn't know what it is to have me if you didn't know what it is to be without me. I will never leave you again. Now, when you're eight, everything surprises you, so really nothing does. I thought, oh, it's handy. If you, if you forget there's a God, they remind you, and I went back to sleep. But to this day, that still feels as if it just happened last night. It, it, it's in the nature of these experiences that they stay immediate in your mind. And I wanted to know where it, what, what it was, but I didn't ever tell anyone what had happened to me till I was in my 40s. I never asked a question. I never got an answer. That's why I majored in college in religion, because I figured, well, when you're there, they tell you what happens if you forget there's a God. But, you know, you have to ask the question. So I became very discouraged. And when I was in my, I think I was, it was just before I turned 20 in that summer, uh, I came home very glum from my summer job, sat down on the bed, and the same light flashed in the room around me, and the same voice said, I will never leave you. So that was when I wanted to know what, what that was. I, it, I became obsessed with finding out what was going on, and that's what started me on researching the afterlife. So as you went forward and looking at things, you know, some people in our audience have probably had experiences where they've heard heard a voice that doesn't quite sound like a human voice, but is a human voice, only it sounds much clearer and more precise and more radiant, I guess would be the quality I would give to spirit voice. Did you ever discover who this being was that was talking to you? Yes, it, it was my, my primary spirit guide, but I didn't meet him until two years ago. So I went my whole life being guided by him. I, I knew, with, I soon, as soon as I figured out about... Um, about spirit guides, which was when I was in my probably early 30s, I realized that's who it had to have been. Um, and that's the kind of thing they will say to us. They will say, I will never leave you. That's, that's always the reassurance they give. Mm -hmm. But I didn't. it's sort of like driving a car. You don't care what's under the hood as long as the car works. And my life was going fine. I had no interest in knowing anything more about my, my primary guide or any of my guides until um, he broke into my life and told me that I had promised to do something that I was now reneging on, and I had to do it, and, and that's how I met him. So at that point then, now you're a grown adult, and you're being told, hey, Roberta, you made a commitment you may have forgotten about, but here it is, lady, <laughs> you know, got to do yes. it. What was that commitment, and how did you go about unfolding that for yourself? Well, I was 68. I mean, I, was, I had gone through a whole life thinking I was just, these, I was doing things for myself. And, um, but I had, one of the primary things I came in to do was to write Liberating Jesus, and he wasn't going to let me skip out. But uh, clearly, I had been, he had been telling me, because, you know, everybody meets, everyone has guides. We meet with our guides while our bodies sleep, and we generally don't have any memory unless there's some reason they want us to have a memory of those meetings. So I was just doing every, everything he told me my whole life. And then came the day when he said, now you've got to write this book about Jesus. And I said, no way, Jose. And he became very frustrated. So that's why he prompted me to, to get a reading so he could jump into the reading and say, uh, 
you got to do this. You don't have a choice. So, so that's when I did it. But that started really the most wonderful relationship of my life with apologies to my husband and children, um, my very, very best friend my, for my whole life. I now know personally, and it's a wonderful feeling. Yeah, I've interviewed a number of guests who have described that, firstly, the reunion being an extraordinary feeling, and then the knowing um, that one has these cycles of intimacy with spirit beings that may be more evolved than we are, but yet we're companion to and we work together from lifetime to lifetime. How did your work in the afterlife um, confirm for you that this was something everybody has access to? Well, the thing is, when we study the afterlife, this is a real science. These are not, I mean, most people know about near-death experiences and not much else. Near-death experiences don't even have anything to do with death. They're, they're, they're an interesting artifact. But there are all kinds of phenomena like that that we can study, and then you start seeing how they all fit together. I, I couldn't make sense of what, some of what the dead were telling us, and I should just say parenthetically that most of the best communications came over in the first half of the 20th century, very end of the 19th, through deep transmediums. And I spent you know, a couple decades reading every one of those I could find. There were whole books of them and sort of... A uh, hundred year old books almost uh, in dusty shelves. Yeah, and, and so uh, many spiritist groups like there are today in Brazil. But I remember in Lilydale, as one example, there were places where yeah. true spiritist communities grew up and nurtured and valued this capacity that people from all over the world or country would come to these one locations and there'd be like 60 spiritists that they could choose from. So when you were doing that um, research into afterlife communication, what part of the world seems to have a consistent, um, I guess, legacy would be that has continued to this day with an awareness by their population, unlike the West, which is slowly coming to revive these awarenesses? Well, I, where I, what I studied was very specific. It was what was had been received in the latter part of the 19th and the first half of the 20th century in the eastern part of the United States and in southern Great, Great Britain. I did study some eastern religions in college, but I decided early on that I didn't want to study religions. Uh, at my, my study in Christianity was kind of disillusioning. I just didn't want to study religions, but I wanted to study original source material. So that's why I wouldn't read things received after 1950. But there's a lot received before 1950 that most people have no awareness of. And you can put it together because Mm -hmm. they're all different experiences these people have had. But it's obvious they're all in the same place, the same process, the same physics, the same pastimes, the same same way they dress, the same way they communicate, the same way they travel. It's all the same so you know it's real. Right. It, it can t- And from century to century, there's common descriptions. So one of the things you state very early on, Roberta, in your book, The Fun of Growing Forever, is dis- a discussion of why we're here. And you say we're here to grow spiritually. So let's start there. Okay. Um, we, we know, uh, based on what the dead have consistently told us, that basically they call this a school. I call it a gym. Uh, we, we come here with a specific plan, just as you might go to the gym to strengthen some of your, your physical muscles. You strip down to shorts and a T-shirt. Here, you can, to, to come here to learn, you strip down to a, a very limited part of your eternal mind. And you get on those machines in this spiritual gym, a loss of a child, loss of a husband, illness on your own part, all the negative things that happen, we planned into our lives as opportunities to grow. Why we can't do this in the afterlife levels? When we ask the question, what the dead pretty much tell us is it's too easy there. To be there is like lolling around on a spiritual couch. You can't read or, 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 or take a lesson, take a, take a course or something and learn how to grow spiritually. It has to be done by doing, just as you have to really go to the gym in order to strengthen your, your, your physical muscles. And and, and I, would, I like what you, I mean, the way your book, and I, I recommend this, if somebody's looking for a shortcut to spiritual growth, it's wonderful in that way because your book is broken into categories of the time for transformation is now, and then you go through these wonderful chapters, which we'll talk about, spiritual growth made simple, and then you have all these beautiful appendices, I mean, hundreds of resources if somebody's interested in these various topics. So in learning that we grow by incarnating and having these experiences, you also make very clear that 
this spiritual growth doesn't necessarily mean we don't have challenges, but it's what we do with our challenges. And you talk a lot about um, how earth minds, when we're here incarnate, we tend to be lazy um, and we tend to adapt and we tend to be controlled by rules. And when I first read that, I went, wow, that sounds like religion. And then you make this big effort of, of distinguishing between religion and spirituality. Yeah, we, we tend to equate them, and actually they're the opposite, um, because we, we now understand that the only thing that exists is what we experience as human consciousness. Obviously, it's much greater than what we experience as consciousness, but it's of the same nature. And it exists in a range of vibrations from the lowest, which is abstract, abstract fear, complete fear, to the highest, which is perfect love. And I know that sounds corny, but... It turns out that what we experience as love is a, is a sort of dim part of what is the most high vibration there is, the, the source vibration. It is perfect, intense love. Now, we'll think about religions. Religions are based in fear. All religions are. In Christianity, it's fear of God, a good God-fearing man, um, fear, fear of, of the devil, fear of hell, fear of making a mistake, fear of guessing wrong. There are 40,000-odd different religious, just Christian denominations. What if you get the wrong one? Will God punish you then? Religions are based in fear, so religions make it impossible to grow spiritually as we need to grow. That could change, but until it changes, uh, anyone who really wants to ace this lifetime can't do it through religion. One of the other things you say, and it's in your subtitle, Fun of Growing Forever, we can't transform the world until we transform ourselves. And Mahatma Gandhi certainly talked about that. You know, we have to become the change in the world yes. we want to see. Oh, yes. Yeah. Many people are, are, are feeling the need to, to fix the world. I mean, we, it's, we, it's getting worse around us. And, and those we used to think were dead are telling us that, indeed, this this horrible negativity we experience and would like to, to, to kill is uh, basically the artifact of too many people over too long a time making the, the fear-based and not the love-based choice, which is what we're here essentially to do. We have free will so we can choose right. And if you choose wrong, you create negativity. And they tell us that an active effort is being made on the very highest levels of reality to raise the, the consciousness of the whole planet. And... That's what we have to do in order to create the kind of world we want to live in. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we'll talk some more with our guests. If you're just joining us, Roberta Grimes is not only an attorney, she's a novelist and a speaker based in Austin, Texas. And she's written a number of books, some of which we've talked about before on 21st Century Radio. However, tonight we're looking at her most recent release, The Fun of Growing Forever. We can't transform the world until we transform ourselves. It's a Christine Anderson Publishing and Media 2016 release. Learn more at Roberta Grimes, G-R-I. I-M-E-S dot com. Hello, this is Nancy McMonigal, the President and Executive Director of the Monroe Institute. I just had the pleasure of talking with a very well-read, experienced, knowledgeable, and entertaining Zoe Hieronymus, who has a lot to share with all of us on her show and personally. And if you'd like to know, not just believe that you are more than your physical body, Make sure you check out our programs at www.monroeinstitute.org. You are listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Zahara Hieronymus. Yeah, go to www.monroeinstitute.org here on the East Coast in Virginia for anybody really interested in developing some of these wonderful skills that um, help us have other experiences that enrich our lives and our understanding of our place in the what will we call that? The continuum. That's how I like to think of it. Roberta Grimes is our guest. She's the author of many books, most recently her book, The Fun of Growing Forever. We Can't Transform the World Until We Transform Ourselves, a 2016 release. And her website tells you more about her work at www.robertagrimes.com. So getting to some of the essence of what you share and what you say Jesus has to bring the world and why these teachings are still so um, important is two things, and we often talk about it and people may think about it, and it deals with 
Forgiveness and gratitude. So let's first start with forgiveness. Why is forgiveness sort of a linchpin in our development and in bringing peace on earth? Simply put, forgiveness is how we make love possible. Until we are forgiving at a very high level, uh, we really can't even love as we are called to love. Our natural state is love. Our minds are part of the only thing that exists, the mind that continuously manifests the universe. So our minds are naturally at a very high vibration. But because our minds are distracted by these things that bother us, and it isn't just people who do bad things to us, it's driving or it's you know, the fact that we can't get the job we want, whatever, whatever is frustrating us, unless we can get that cleared out, that negative energy keeps us down. But once we have learned universal forgiveness, and you can learn it and it's not hard, we're no longer bothered by any of this anymore. And your mind just naturally rises like a bubble in water. It's, it's, it's easy to love once you've cleared away all the obstacles to love's presence. Part of that journey, of course, deals with gratitude. You know, one's like the right leg and the left leg. One is humility, the left leg in Kabbalah. And the right leg, Natsak, is like our enduring will to do. And so you kind of need these balances of aptitude. So if forgiveness is one side of the coin, gratitude obviously has a lot to do with what we're able to do and how we go about doing it. What's interesting is that Jesus doesn't really talk about gratitude directly. It's implied in a lot of his teachings. But what I discovered when I set out to actually learn this for myself, um, I found that gratitude is sort of how you have to start. It sort of clears away all the negativity and and brings you up to a a base level. Because we live our lives with a kind, unless we've, we've worked on this, we live our lives with kind of a base crankiness. Um, we never, our lives are never perfect. We don't have exactly what we want. Our husband was cranky this morning, and that makes us cranky too. All the things that bother our lives, we, we, to clear that away, um, we've got to learn to be basically grateful for everything. And it's not hard to do that either. It becomes a, a, a set point for you that's just higher than your set point was. From there, it's much easier to learn universal forgiveness. Part of the uh, experience you've had and then you translate it into how other people can nurture, cultivate, I mean, like anything, whether it's gardening in the physical world or gardening our natures, it takes nurturance. You have to get rid of the weeds. You have to water it. It needs sunshine. It needs rest, etc. You talk about driving literally physically driving in our car. And I love this because I use driving for all kinds of developmental time. I One of the things I've done for years, I mean, decades, is I try to picture the color of the next car coming just to hone in on my intuition. Or, you know, is there going when you're driving on the highway? Should I get off at this exit or another? And those things to some people might seem like a waste of time. But if you do them over years and years and years and years, it really does strengthen whatever it is you're working on. So you have this beautiful chapter nine in your book, Driving as a Wonderful Spiritual Exercise. Well, we, we don't, we, of course, we're not doing it at your wonderful level where you're predicting car colors. This is more like uh, learning how not to be insane on the road, which I once was. Uh, many people drive as if it were a, uh, a participation sport. And that that, that's not healthy for you or for anyone. And but what I learned was that when you're driving, your mind is sufficiently distracted that you can apply forgiveness much more easily. And it's, you, you don't, I mean, you've got to pay attention to the road. You've got to pay attention to other people or else you can't get out of their way. So you, you're, you're in this situation, sort of you're, you're a captive uh, person in a situation which is by its nature stressful, but you can turn that into an opportunity for love, forgiveness, kindness, and it's not even, it actually happens very quickly if that's what you make driving into. You're, you're sort of operating at a much higher level. You're kind of doing the Ph.D. level, and I'm doing the kindergarten level of how driving can help you. But all that I do is based in how to make this as simple as possible, because we're all living our lives. We have so much going on. We can't I can't meditate, I can't do yoga, I can't learn anything complicated, I just have too much else going on. And most people seem to be the same way. But the beauty of these teachings is that they're sort of a while you're at it kind of way over just a few months to really rapidly raise your vibration, and it stays high. You don't 
go back to the old ways. I'm amazed by that. Well, the beauty, really, Roberta, of this book, of all your books, you know, your fun books, is that they are simple. They're big text, which I really appreciate, and with Me big, too. bold <laughs> highlights of the main themes so that they're easy to use, easy as a study guide, easy to go back to. Um, and what I liked about your driving exercise is that you really do turn it into a spiritual practice. And most yeah. of us drive. I mean, some people take public transportation or they walk or they ride their bike, but most people in the listening audience drive or are driven and or even if you're in the bus the same thing is to practice this awareness because it really is a very good model for living in community I mean I agree with you there are times where I feel like somebody would rather that I just crash and die on the highway than let me (laughs) on or off you know if they're speeding along or whatever and and that practice of forgiveness is really great because we have so many opportunities for it oh yes yeah, I, and that's what's, why it's valuable to use uh, the, these teachings in your daily life because we all have a – driving is a great example, but every day we have opportunities for, to, for, for forgiveness, whether it's a coworker or a spouse or child or just anything that happens in your life, there's another chance to forgive. So we give us, give us an example. Way. You know, there's thousands, literally thousands of methods. Um, give us how you do it. Like, let's say you're on the highway and somebody cuts you off. Describe to us what you would do and what your process is for forgiveness. Well, it's easier to do it, not to do it on the highway in the beginning because there's a basic thing, which is really, I think, the secret to learning to forgive. And I, I've since discovered that other people have other methods that work the same way. What we need to do, the re, let, let's look at the reason people need to forgive, because things bother us. And it turns out, remember that sort of lazy uh, mind you have that, that it learns quickly and then happily will change things if need be? We've taught our minds to react. If, if somebody cuts us off on the road, if, if, if um, our boss is cranky, whatever it is, we've taught ourselves to get whoop, really upset immediately. We don't think that's what we're doing, but we have. So it's to learn to forgive everything perfectly is as simple as teaching your mind never to react. That's all it is. Now, you can do this on the road, but you, can, you might crash. So I, I, rec- <laughs> I recommend doing this primarily when you're not on the road. But what I, what I learned to do is just use my, mo- my arms to sort of imagine I'm gathering up whatever is bothering me. And I, I, you, you have to do this before it really sets in. You know, my darn husband, he didn't take out the trash again. I'm going to get mad at him in one second. Before that happens, you gather up. Your husband, the trash, the, the morning, everything, and you gather it up and you make a nice tight ball out of it. And I believe we should jump into the ball ourselves. And we get it all, all, all tiny and tight. And then we, we push it away with both hands while we say, I love you, I bless you, I forgive, and I release. You may have to do it twice in the beginning. I did. But pretty soon you only do it once. And then you notice within a month or two, it's not bothering you anymore. You've retrained your mind not to not to react because your mind is really lazy if you're not going to react to what it serves up it's going to stop doing it and i really realized the difference when one day something really i may have been on the road i don't remember what it was now but i had something happen that was really dramatic and bad and i didn't even react and i thought wow that's really great but what i learned was we had sort of levers on our outside which people can fiddle with and make us crazy. Yeah, they call them, I think, triggers in psychology. Yeah. You know, somebody can say something and it triggers something that was really important that happened 30 years ago. And at first you don't even realize that some stranger or somebody you know has said something or done something that has triggered this whole sequela of emotional history that just yeah. rises to the surface. And you go, whoa, where'd that come from? Yeah. But what happens when you have done this exercise enough, and consistently, you can't do it only sometimes, it has to be a focus for a month or two. When you've done that, you sort of disconnect on the inside all those levers. Things still happen. You say, oh, my goodness, that used to really bother me, but it doesn't anymore. Now, I have since learned that there's a simpler way to do it. All um, right, we're ready for this one. Now we're all paying attention. What's the shortcut? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, this, I, I didn't need to do this. I was already past this point. But apparently if you just keep something in your pocket, whether it's a pencil or, or whatever it is, keep something in your pocket. Whenever you're about to be upset, you just put it in the opposite pocket. I don't know if that works, but I'm told it does work. And, but it would 
do the same Well, you know thing. what it reminds me of? It's so funny you say that. It reminds me of certain ways you train dogs, and the dog whisperer says, you know, you use this, pss, pss, this sort of, you reattract the mind of the dog, not from what it's doing, but to the noise you're making. So you've shifted the brain in that moment of aggression. You've basically repatterned the input. And it reminds me very much of that. It's we're repatterning the input to something to remind us not to get triggered. Yes, yes, exactly. And with, with I, I mean, I pref- I still prefer the "I love you," "I bless you," "I forgive," and "I release" because that's way the way we should be thinking. Right, yes, which is we, also yeah. a very affirmative act. I mean, to say those words is to do good. I, I think we have a culture that has so mis. Um, Undervalued would be the right word. Undervalued prayer and the power of speech, affirmative speech. And yes, exactly that's right. That's why yes. expressing gratitude, you know, it's interesting. Pretty much, I think of all the different spiritual teachers I've interviewed over some 30 odd years, and it doesn't matter from what discipline or what religion or what practice, but it's interesting to me how many of them have talked about gratitude and praying from a point of gratitude and not depravity. So yes. the Native American would say when you do the rain dance, you thank creator for the rain that has already fallen and you smell the rain and you touch the rain and you taste the rain. You don't pray from a sensation of drought, even if you're in drought. And the same thing for forgiveness. I mean, I, I often feel that we don't always ask, not only for our higher self, but those around us, whether they're deceased loved ones or angels or spirit guides who are there to help us and assist us in our elevating our consciousness and changing our vibration and therefore having access to better and better resource. Um, But I sometimes feel like we don't know how to ask for gratitude. And the easiest way is to feel gratitude. You know, rather than to feel like, oh, my God, I feel so ungrateful and I don't know why. And please, it's, it's to say, wow, I really feel gratitude. And, and sometimes it's, I mean, people, I've even talked to Buddhists who says it's just about smiling. Just practice well, smiling. The, the, the techniques and the tips are very simple. And it simply comes down to paying attention to whatever quality it is in your own life that you want to transform. And once we pay enough attention to it, we start listening to our own wisdom. It's very important, too, never to pray from lack. That was such a wonderful tip because yeah. our, our minds are powerful. So if you say, oh, may I please have a new, this new job, what you're saying is, I don't have this new job. Your, your mind is affirming what, yeah. you, what you don't want, and you're, more, you're less likely to have it work. If you st- instead say, Thank you for this wonderful job that is manifesting in my life. You you claim the gift. You claim the rain. Exactly. You claim, and, and but it it turns out that's the spiritual physics is based in that. It's the most profound normal thing in the world that if you pray from lack, you're not going to get it. If you pl- if you pray in gratitude for the gift that you don't yet have, but still it's being manifested as you speak you're much more likely to get what you want. Of course, because if you show gratitude and really feel that sense of gratitude to the universe creator, whatever it is that you appreciate about your role in the cosmos, so to speak, um, that we experience the energy of gratitude and then it draws to it those like things that manifest that gratitude. And it's the same way, you know, it's a part of low magic where you have a symbol of something that you care about, like when I wear a wolf charm because I'm doing something with the wolf. Um, It doesn't matter what it is. Any quality that we want to draw to us, we bring that into our life in some form. So if you want, as you point out, to have a better job, you thank the universe already or God or however it is you do your addressing. Thank you for this opportunity of a new job. Yeah. And I, I have always found that so interesting because oftentimes you'll hear people say, well, I got a whole shopping list of things I'm praying for. And I'm, you know, the other thing that I've learned from many spiritual teachers is you pray for one thing not a shopping list of 10 things, which helps you really identify what it is you actually need, not all the things you want. Yeah, and it focuses your energy on manifesting what yeah. that thing is, yeah. as opposed to scattering it over a bunch of things. The other thing you point out is how important it is to be quick to apologize. Yes, yes. Yeah, and I've had plenty of opportunity, too. But it, it's in order to... 
improve the, the vibration of your own mind and the uh, vibration of the planet. You can't allow negativity to come between you and any other human being. Um, the, the most, this was the first lesson I ever learned from a client back 30-some years ago when I began as an attorney. Uh, he said, uh, he was a, a salesman, and he said, you know, whenever something goes wrong, I kind of pray something will go wrong when I get a new client, because then I can rush in and fix it, and I've got a client for life. And I thought that was a wonderful point. The more you, we, we think apologizing will make us seem weak, but instead it makes, makes us seem wrong. We think if we apologize and say, gee, I'm so sorry I did that, whatever it was, people were going to say, oh, you idiot, you did that. Instead they think, oh, you probably aren't the one who did that. People love you for apologizing. And so that's kind of just a basic bit of wisdom and how, how we can make our own lives better and the be- lives of everyone around us better. You know, it's a habitual thing. You want everybody to be happy, and that's part of how you help it happen. Right, and as I say, and if you don't feel that way, pretend that you do. And yes. people look at me and go, well, that's faking it. And I said, no, that's practicing it. <laughs> that's a good point. Well, th- yeah. it's really the truth, because even when athletes want to practice a swing or shoot to the basket, they'll practice it in their mind, and nobody says, oh, you're faking it. No, you're practicing it. That's so right. even when you don't feel, as my mother used to say when I was younger, and she'd say, how are you? And I'd say, fine. And her response would be, tell your face. Oh. <laughs> so so the message <laughs> like was, well, even if you're not, fake it, because it makes everybody else feel better around you. It certainly does. It and it's not being fake. For you. It's being empowering for the community. You know, and I think this is really important, and, and it seems so simple. Um, but we've lost manners and a sensibility about manners. And I often joke now, and now I believe it's really true. It started out as a joke, and now I think it's true, that just having good manners is a spiritual path. At this point in our culture, to say thank you, that's gratitude. To say I'm sorry when you shut the door on somebody's foot, that's manners. You know, but these are all aspects of spiritual paths. And so it struck me that there was a time in our culture where just decent manners was a form of collective spiritual discipline. So that even people that weren't like on a dedicated spiritual path and for whatever astrological reasons their generation wasn't here to do that work, ours is, and everybody living now are on that path, um, that manners and just the notion of right human relations was a spiritual and remains a spiritual path. Yes, absolutely. I should point out, too, about the fun of, of living forever is that it's based in the teachings of Jesus. Now, there are people listening who, because Christianity is a fear-based religion, um, are uneasy about talking about anything related to any other religion. These are the non-religious teachings of Jesus, simply applied, exactly what he came to teach. Um, In point of fact, it's not religious practice, but since most Christians don't understand how serious Jesus is about his teachings, um, we may as well use them since they are, I think, they're the easiest method to grow spiritually and to grow rapidly. And, uh, and P.S., if you're a Christian, you can use these teachings with perfect confidence that you're not doing anything that's in violation of your religion. Our guest is Roberta Grimes. The book... The fun of growing forever. We can't transform the world until we transform ourselves. It is a foreword by Jack Canfield. And you can go to www.robertagrimes.com. Hello, this is Joyce Levine. I'm the chair of the National Council for Geocosmic Research. You can learn more about our organization at www.geocosmic.org. And you can learn more about my astrology work at www.joycelevine.com. You are listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Zahara Hieronymus. Roberta Grimes is our guest. So, you know, we often think of forgiveness as that which we do relative to our relationship to others. But there's also really times in our lives where the forgiveness is self-forgiveness. And it's not always something everybody um, has the easiest time with. So let's talk a bit about that. What techniques you have or, or how to go about the self-forgiveness? I think self-forgiveness is the hardest exercise we have to do because we, um, and I hear from people all the time, I hear from people in grief, and whenever grief lasts, it's because we blame ourselves for the death. Mm-hmm. And, and when I tell people that, then suddenly that opens the floodgates and they talk about it. It's very hard. 
And a lot of it, uh, it seems to me, comes first from um, uh, a lot of the, the success in beating it comes first from recognizing that you are perfectly loved. Uh, it, we, c- we think as Christians that, you know, we've got original sin, God doesn't partner us, God, God loves us, but he blames us, and so we're going to go to hell. We have a lot of negativity around ourselves, which comes from the fact that we are taught that we are so deficient. But what I teach people is quite the opposite. You are God's best beloved child, and as soon as you come to understand that that's true, you see yourself differently. But you're right, it is very tough. One of the things I tell people is if you have trouble with doing this exercise, and what, basically what you do is you jump into each forgiveness ball as you're making it. You say, I love you, I bless you, you mean yourself as well when you push it away. But if that doesn't work, then you need to get counseling, you need to get somebody to help you understand why it is you blame yourself. But the other thing I think you need to do is maybe not go to church for a while. Instead, spend time in meditation with God. And understand that God perfectly loves you. Because how can you blame yourself when you are God's best beloved child? Doesn't God know better than you do? I mean, I've, had to, I've counseled people. The, the, the only people I've really had to spend time counseling have, have been people who have this problem. So you're right. It's a, it's a very difficult problem. And, and it's a, a road we each have to take our, on our own because there isn't a mechanical way to change it. Only doing the mechanical exercise in forgiveness will help. But ultimately, underneath it, there may be things you need to work out with a counselor. One of the points you make in many different ways from different directions is this quality of forgiveness being a universal process. And I remember um, one time I interviewed somebody, and then we did some work together, and they wanted to know who appointed me God. And I said, what are you talking about? I was really a little annoyed when they said this. And then they said, well, you actually think you're here to fix the world. And I went, well, of course I am, I said. And it took me a while to appreciate what they were telling me was to try to forgive the world. Meaning, you know, when when we all get quiet enough and understand the world is, is exactly as the world needs to be because all of humanity has created the world just as it is right this very moment, from the good to the bad, the ugly, the beautiful. And our job, as you point out, and as any spiritual counselor who's done the self-work to speak as a spiritual counselor knows, it really is about cultivating the self and cultivating the capacity for compassion and forgiveness and gratitude and all these things we've been talking about, but they sound like words until you start doing the practice and the re- the reward is in the practice, not the reading about it. But reading yes, about you said, it you, helps you, us. You're right. You 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 can't you can't read about it and have any have it have any effect on you. But what I've found is that when you learn forgiveness and you and you you get it as I say, it takes a couple of months of really applying it to your life. But you, you no longer are bothered by anything. And there's no um, difference in degree. Well, I could forgive this. I certainly couldn't forgive that. You know, murder. Right. Let's have a rating chart. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. But, but, there, but it's all forgiveness. When you truly learn how to forgive, it doesn't matter what horrible thing people have done to somebody you, you love or to you yourself. You don't react to it in the same way. And that's very freeing. Because it doesn't change anything. If, if something bad has happened, you don't feel better about it because you're furiously angry with the person who did it. You feel worse. But to have the power over your own emotions and your own life and, and, and the power over the world to be able to forgive anything that happens to you, that's power. And well, and I think as you, you write, greater. as you also point out, it really is a gift we can give ourselves. You know, Perfect. being angry at somebody and not forgiving them gives them still the power over whatever that event was that you're replaying a thousand times in your mind and toxifying yourself every time you play it because oh, the body's so responding so, to your mind. So perfectly true. Yes, so important that you say that. Yeah, and so as I say to people, you know, if you really want to think about forgiveness from another vantage point, it might be very selfish, but it's really good for you to forgive others. Yes. I mean, the the forgiver is really the beneficiary of the forgiveness. Yes. I mean, not to say the person who did the this or the that or the situation, but it changes the power of that waveform. I've often thought we can change history. Like if we all remote view the past and we all drop ourselves into 1943 during the war and we forgive the Germans and we forgive Hitler and we forget all the decisions that were made, it changes the impact of that waveform in the current psyche of the living 
and in the psyche of the dead who have souls who took part in that physical event. And so I actually look at physics as being this incredible love wave that comes in and changes the actual frequency of the event that occurred from the past. Yes, and because there is no time, objectively, the only right. place time exists is in our, uh, fit, our material universe. When we get outside of time, we are able to retroactively change history. That's something which I play with in my mind. It's very hard to understand, but you can see how um, having definitive, definitively applied positive power, mental power, to some key events in the past, well, and if those history. those who suggest we're in ten dimensions simultaneously, and this always warps my own mind when I try to talk about <laughs> yes. it publicly with anybody, yes. oh, yeah, here we are in all ten dimensions, yes. and this is one of yes. them. In some other dimension, we might be at war in the 1800s right now, and being able to forgive anybody who chooses, you know, to do things that aren't life elevating and aren't life affirming, um, helps us appreciate how much fear there is everywhere. And, you know, and, I, and I've and i talked about this now for so many decades, this, this polarity between love and fear. People often think that hate is the opposite of love, but most people will suggest to you that it's fear. It is fear. The, 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 those we used to think were dead tell us that absolutely the lowest vibration is fear. Clustered at the lowest end, of course, are hatred, anger, grief, every negative emotion you could think of. Those are all sort of at the bottom. But fear is the core. Once you learn not to be afraid, you, you never will fear anything. I'm convinced that death is the core fear, which is why I find it so empowering to understand that, um, in, indeed, it's impossible for us to die. Nobody ever dies. When you really get that, you don't fear anything. You don't fear the mortgage payment. It's amazing to me how fear is just this artifact of negativity that you can get rid of. You can get it out of your life forever. And yet, of course, we live in a society that manipulates the community of mind through mind control and fear. And once you induce fear, you have access to the mind. And so unfortunately, truthfully, yeah. the sociopathic world we live in has really perfected the use of fear for mind control over the masses. And that's what I actually feel is in the way of our tremendous evolution that can happen now. Right today. Yes, yes. I, that's beautifully said, and it's true. But we have the power in our own lives and the lives of those we love to get rid of fear forever. So they will no longer be able to play with our minds. And that is so freeing. There's nothing more freeing than that. And once you get rid of the fear, as I say, your mind just rises naturally because your, your true state is perfect love. That's who you really are. And when you get rid of what's in the way of that, that's who you become. And there's no happiness like that. Nothing makes you happy like perfect love. And, and I feel like, you know, oftentimes in the path of service, we talk about this for anybody who doesn't feel love in their life or feels unloved. I always say, go serve somebody who's less fortunate yeah. than yourself. And it really yeah. is the truth that we're all here to serve and we're all here to learn. And by doing those things and confronting our own sort of, um, I guess, fear of the unknown is what most people are afraid of. And it doesn't matter what that unknown is. Uh, as you point out, having some sense of gratitude for the opportunity to even be here. And as one of my teachers said, you know, the greatest joy in life is to become a mystery to yourself. And <laughs> wow, I always loved that profound. expression because it really opens you to the unknown and says, hey, I don't really know what the next decade will bring, but I can say that today this is what I'm going to do and this is how I'll behave. And if you're living not in fear but in love, to see your own life as a mystery is a happy thing. It's not a fearful mystery. It's a joyous mystery. We are so much greater than we ever imagined. I cannot even comprehend the glory of what each person is. After all the study I've done, that's what it brings me to. You mm -hmm. are infinitely wonderful and glorious. Mm -hmm. Each person listening is. Yeah, you're not the only person who's done this kind of work to come to that conclusion, who comes yeah. at it from the self-examination right. journey rather than, I read this and this is what my guru told me, And but through the journey oh. of self-discovery. And, and, you know, I feel like that that's the greatest journey for all of us, each one of us, because we're each here to have a different set of experiences to grow from. One of the beautiful things, Roberta, I want to thank you for, besides just the book text itself, is the resources you have in Appendix 2, um, and it can help 
anybody who wants to learn more either from near-death experiences or post-death realities. Talk to us a bit about your going and putting all of this together and what you were hoping to accomplish. I don't think anyone should take my, my word for it or, or yours or any word, anyone's word for this stuff. Nobody should, should be looking for a guru. Instead, the only way to empower yourself is for you to learn the truth for yourself. So what I tried to assemble was all the books that I had found be personally useful, and I'm still gathering them. Each time we do a new edition of any of these books, it'll have an updated, an annotated bibliography. But many people have, have just emailed me and said, well, I'm, I'm in this section now, or I'm reading in that section. I feel like I'm a, a mentor of this gigantic class, and all these people are taking this class. And it's a glorious thing. But I chose books, and I tell people these are, these are the easy ones, this is the hard ones, so that you, you can do the same work at either a kindergarten level or a Ph.D. level, and you'll get to the same place. So whatever is your own way of learning, you can use that bibliography to do it. It's a wonderful bi bibliography, and I've interviewed a number of the guests that you point to. I love Lynn, Mc Lynn McTaggart's book in um, The Field, a, a beautiful oh, contribution. Yeah. So we have oh, about yeah. 45 seconds left, and I'd like to hand that over to you to say whatever it is you'd like to share with our audience. Or Burden, I want to say in advance, thank you so much for the work you do. Well, th thank you for having me here. The most important thing I want you to take away, everyone, is the fact that you are a powerful, eternal being. You never began and you never will end. It's impossible for anything to harm you. You are perfectly safe. Um, that's once you get that, you'll never be afraid of anything ever again in your life, and you'll find life to be just just joy. We're out of time tonight. We'll follow up in the future, www.robertagrimes.com. 21st Century Radio is produced by Hieronymus & Company. Our executive producer and research assistant is Laura Cortner. Our engineer is Anita Brockington, and I'm Dr. Zohara Hieronymus.